This is the M1 2020 13-inch MacBook Pro, a device that I've been waiting for for years. You see, I've been a big Mac fan myself for quite some time now, and I also enjoy Apple's Macs too, as I've been using a Mac as my daily computer ever since I got my 2011 13-inch MacBook Pro. Yeah, that's nine years going strong. I also consider myself to be, or have been at least, a pro user, as over time I've edited hundreds of videos on Macs, edited hundreds of thumbnails, and ran my entire company and channel from a Mac. The 2013 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro was by far the device that impressed me the most when I got it. Compared to my 2011 13-inch, the 2013 15-inch had a Retina display, the first one on a laptop, it had full flash storage so everything was blazing fast, it had a dedicated GPU, a quad-core processor over my dual core inside my 2011 model, it was larger yet thinner and lighter so overall there hasn't been a single device that impressed me as much as that laptop. Until now at least. The M1 MacBook Pro has exceeded every single one of my expectations. So in this video, I'll be covering my experience with the M1 MacBook Pro after using it for an entire month. This video will cover everything from the design to the camera, the performance, the battery life, and so, so much more. This video is sponsored by LG and their brand new LG X-Boom Go PL series speakers. They offer amazing sound quality powered by their Meridian technology with clear vocals and very impressive bass given their size. Speaking of sizes, they come in three with 10, 18, and even 24 hours of battery life. They all feature USB Type-C charging and you even get customizable LED lights on the PL5 and the PL7 that react based on the music. Oh, and they're also IPX5 water resistant. <laughs> Check them out using the link below. Starting off with the design, the M1 model looks identical to the 2016 and newer MacBooks, as Apple only updates the design every four years. That being said, there is a new 14-inch MacBook Pro rumored to be coming next year as we have seen quite a few reports on that. So, if you do plan on buying this M1 MacBook Pro, keep in mind that the design will very likely be out of date in just a few months. However, I'm still a very big fan of this design. Even though it is 4 years old, it still looks and feels very premium when compared to other laptops. Sure, the bezels are fairly thick when compared to laptops such as the Dell XPS 13, however, the design language is still very strong here. The 2016 and 2017 models had issues such as case popping and many quality control issues, which I am glad to say that this model has none of. Also, the fact that Apple is still using that 2016 design is actually a very good decision in terms of the thermals, which I'll get back to in just a second. Display-wise, the MacBook Pro 13-inch still has the same display panel as the 2016 model, which is an IPS LCD panel with a 2560 by 1600 resolution and DCI-P3 color space coverage. What this means is that this is pretty much still the very best laptop display for grading video and editing photos as it is super accurate color-wise. The brightness is still the same at 500 nits, which is also one of the brightest panels on any laptop right now. Again, I would have loved to see thinner bezels here, but the sheer quality of the display panel really makes up for it. Then the keyboard is absolutely amazing, guys. Even though this is the same keyboard as on the 2020 13-inch Intel MacBook Pro that I was using before, I'm still in love with this keyboard to this very day. Typing experience is outstanding and a gigantic improvement over the butterfly keyboard. This is actually my favorite keyboard on a laptop, whereas the butterfly keyboard was actually my least favorite. We do have a dedicated emoji key now, well technically it is a region switch key right on the FN button, but if you only have one region then this will automatically trigger the emoji selector, which is actually very useful to have as the touch bar sometimes actually hides it when you're in specific menus. When it comes to the trackpad, this is unchanged from the 2016 model. You still get a very large glass surface, which doesn't actually click. Instead, you get a haptic motor underneath it, which vibrates and gives you the impression that it clicks. And the trackpad is also the best trackpad that I've ever used on a laptop. The front camera is the same as on the 2016 models, which is a 720p sensor. However, with a 2018 MacBook Pro, which added the T2 chip, we got a noticeably better image processing, which was now handled by that T2 processor. On the M1 model, the image processing is handled by the M1, and we do get even better results than on the T2 Max. The microphones have also been improved, as we now get studio quality mics, just like on the 16-inch MacBook Pro. 
and the fact that the fan is pretty much silent all the time results in significantly better audio when compared to the 2020 Intel model. And that audio is so good that I could literally use it in an entire video or even in a podcast and I don't think you would be able to tell the difference between our actual microphone. Uh, but yeah, have a look and listen for yourselves. This is a front-facing camera test and a microphone test on the 2017 15-inch Macro Pro, which does not have the D2 chip. And this is a front-facing camera and a microphone test on the 2020 Intel 13-inch Macro Pro, which does have the D2 chip. And now this is a front-facing camera and a microphone test on the brand new 2020 M1 MacBook Pro. The speakers are pretty much identical to the ones before. They're very, very good. They're loud and they have a lot of detail in the highs and the mids and decent bass as well. Now, in terms of special features, I would say that the most unique thing about this laptop is the fact that it has two USB 4 ports, which not a lot of laptops do right now. However, they're both on the left-hand side, and they only support one single display port stream uh, together, meaning that you can only connect one single external monitor to this MacBook Pro, uh, which is actually a major downgrade over the Intel model, which could support four or even more monitors, really. That single monitor can indeed be up to 6K in resolution, and while you can use a DisplayLink adapter to basically stream video onto more external monitors, so you can actually get more than one that way, uh, the quality will be noticeably lower than powering those monitors natively. And obviously expensive. Now, another special feature used to be the ability to connect an eGPU, which actually worked quite well in macOS. But unfortunately, this is no longer supported on the M1 Max, likely due to the fact that drivers on M1 Max have to be run natively, they cannot be uh, emulated, and uh, we don't have any updated drivers from AMD at the moment. And finally, another special feature used to be the ability to run any operating system you wanted on a Mac, uh, which, you know, this is amazing for developers. You could run Mac OS, Windows, and many, I mean, actually any distribution of Linux. Uh, however, at the moment, you can only run Mac OS. Windows and Linux will be supported, but uh, through virtualization, once we get updates to apps like Parallels, uh, but the ability to run Windows natively through Bootcamp is no longer supported. Apple has stated that they are willing to add support for Windows natively as long as Microsoft lets Apple use their ARM version of Windows. So that could happen in the future, but for now, if you plan on installing Windows or running any Windows games, unless you're okay with emulating those using Crossover, which doesn't really work that well all the time, you're out of luck. And now it is time to talk about the performance, the section that you are all here for. And definitely make sure to subscribe for more insanely detailed tech videos like this one hopefully is, and hopefully like the performance section is going to be in just a second. So yeah, I gotta say, this is by far what impressed me the most about this Mac, the performance. You see, when Apple released the 2016 design, they designed them with Intel's 10 nanometer processors in mind, which were supposed to be released in 2015 to 2016, exactly when Apple's new MacBook design launched. But Intel kept delaying and delaying, and instead added more cores and higher clocks onto their out-of-date 14 nanometer architecture, which resulted in a lot of heat being generated, and to this very day, we still do not have a 10 nanometer Intel processor suitable for something like a 16-inch Macbook Pro or even uh, the desktops. The next step after 10 nanometers would be 7, uh, the one after would be 5, Apple's already on 5, and Intel's still struggling with 10. What this means is that that M1 processor can achieve significantly better performance while consuming significantly less power, which in turn results in less heat and better battery life. Like honestly, just using this in general feels so much faster and so much more responsive than my 2020 Intel model from just a few months ago. Not only that, but the fan never kicks in, not even when rendering video. It is pretty much entirely silent uh, as, you know, it never gets hot.
Now, there are three types of apps that you can run on these M1 Macs. The first type are native apps. These are mostly the ones made by Apple at the moment, and these run absolutely amazing. You'll see in just a second that they run far better than any of the previous Intel Macs. The second are apps that were designed for Intel, but run through Rosetta, a translation layer that Apple has designed. Now, these don't run as well as on Intel, processors and Macs, um, at least most of them don't, but there are a few exceptions where you could actually see better performance than on Intel Macs. And then the third type are apps that don't actually run at all. <laughs> uh, and that's because they rely on specific drivers which haven't been developed for the M1 chips yet. A good example would be Google Drive File Stream, Motion VFX, and loads of audio and video plugins that do require some uh, drivers. Oh, and you can also run iOS apps natively, but developers can actually disable that. And unfortunately, most developers have actually done that. So uh, if you're thinking about running your favorite iOS apps on a new M1 Mac, Unfortunately, I could only find about 10% or so of my iPhone apps that I could run on the M1 Max. You can manually put the app files onto your Mac and they would work that way, uh, but when it comes to downloading them from the App Store, most of them, unfortunately, are not available at the moment. Now, this model right here is the 16 gigabytes of RAM model, um, and here's how it compares against my 2020 13-inch with a quad-core Intel i5 10-generation processor, uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM, as well as my 2019 15-inch 8-core MacBook Pro with 32 gigabytes of RAM and the Radeon 560X graphics. In terms of the boot time, the 2019 15-inch was actually the fastest, taking just 10 seconds, while the M1 took almost double at 19. The wake from sleep time was significantly improved, with the M1 taking just half a second to wake up. Like, I literally went back to using my Intel model for a bit, and I just couldn't bear it. Like, everything that I was doing was so slow and so sluggish, and the fans started spitting like crazy, and the MacBook got super hot, even when I just opened up email. So, uh, yeah. It just, honestly, it just doesn't compare. Then, in Geekbench 5, the M1 model simply destroyed the Intel model from just a few months ago, and even outperformed my 15-inch with an i9 processor 8 cores, which is crazy. Uh, in Cinebench, then, which uh, stresses out the CPU more continuously, the M1 model outperformed, yes, again, my 2019 8-core 15-inch, while being completely silent. And yes, it absolutely murdered the 2020 13-inch Intel model. And surprisingly, it did all of that while maintaining a higher clock speed when compared to the 13-inch or even my 15-inch. And it only consumed 13.9 watts of power when compared to 45 watts on the 13-inch Intel and almost 65 watts on the 15-inch model. And there was also another massive difference when it came to the temperatures. The 13-inch Intel was at 99.8 degrees Celsius, the 15-inch was surprisingly cooler at just, just 89, but the M1 was at 71. Yes, even cooler than the 15-inch, while of course delivering even better performance. We then used a thermal camera to measure the chassis temperature, and here, the 13-inch Intel was running at 40 degrees, while the M1 model was sitting at just 36 degrees. So, yeah, if you plan on using these on your lap, the M1 is going to be much cooler, while also being almost entirely silent. Moving on to some real-world usage, in Lightroom, running natively on both now, we imported 228 raw photos, up to 50 megapixels in size, from multiple cameras, and here, the 13-inch Intel took 40 seconds to import the photos, while the M1 took 49. Very strange. And we then ran the same test, but with Rosetta on the M1 model, and this time it took 47 seconds. So the M1 actually took longer when running Lightroom natively. Also, the 8GB of RAM model running natively took 50 seconds, so the 16GB of RAM model was a tiny bit faster here. We then made some slight edits to one of the images and pasted those edits to all the other 228 raw photos. And here, the Intel model took 1 minute and 21 seconds, while the M1 running in Rosetta took 1 minute and 7 seconds. However, when running natively, this took 1 minute and 9 seconds. So, still faster than the Intel, but not as fast as running through Rosetta. Seems like Adobe has way more optimizations to do. We then took the raw photos folder and compressed it on both the 13-inch Rango Pros, and here, the 13-inch Intel took 15 minutes and 20 seconds, while the M1 took 11 minutes and 5 seconds. The 8GB of RAM M1, by the way, took pretty much the same. Now, in terms of video editing performance in Final Cut, we tested two projects, both being actual videos that we made in the past. The first one was an easier project, as it was a Leaks Rumors episode covering the iPhone 13. Uh, 
this is mostly just a single 4K clip with some images, renders, and some effects, but the overall project is fairly simple. And exporting this to 31 minutes on the Intel model versus just 11 minutes on the M1 model. Also, the 8GB of RAM M1 MacBook Pro took 11 minutes and 22 seconds, so that one did indeed take a bit longer, while the MacBook Air took almost 12 minutes. So we can definitely see the improvements that an active fan and more RAM makes to the render times. Now, in terms of the playback and quality mode, the M1 model was significantly more fluid here, while the Intel model was dropping frames pretty heavily. Uh, you'll actually see a very different result once we get to our second test in just a minute here. We then switch to performance mode, where they were pretty much the same, so very fluid here on both. The second project was way more complex, as this was our iPhone 12 Pro camera comparison, and here we had five 4K picture-in-picture -picture clips, out of which four were actually 4K60. We had color grading on my recording, and an animated background behind everything, plus effects and plus titles. This was really our most complex project we've ever made. And the playback was quite choppy, to be honest, on both machines. Interesting enough, the Intel model was actually quite a bit more fluid here during that difficult 4K60 picture-in-picture -picture stabilization test. And the 13-inch MacBook Pro Intel exported this in 4 hours and 30 minutes, while the 2019 15-inch took 1 hour and 6 minutes. However, this new M1 model actually exported this in just 46 minutes. Um, that's 30% faster than even the 15-inch, which is insane. Like, keep in mind that we do not have a dedicated GPU inside of this, everything is just integrated. And the fact that it outperforms a 2019 fairly high-spec 15-inch model is just incredible. We then took this file and converted it into an H.265 file, and the 13-inch Intel model took 20 minutes and 25 seconds. The 15-inch took literally the same as H.265 encoding, actually uses the Apple-developed T2 chip. However, the M1 was a bit faster at 19 minutes and 36 seconds. We then tested out gaming, and here in StarCraft 2, which was running natively on the Intel models, um, but through emulation on the M1, here the Intel 13-inch got 60 FPS at a resolution of 1680 by 1050 and on maxed out settings, which was actually very, very impressive, the 15-inch model got even higher at 82, and interesting enough, the M1 um, only got 25. However, when it came to native games, such as World of Warcraft, which has actually been optimized for the M1 chip, the 13-inch Intel model was running at 16 FPS. Uh, this was at 2560 by 1600 resolution and with everything maxed out. The 2019 15-inch model was running at 27 frames per second, while the M1 was running at 32. Yes, even better than the 15-inch model, which did have a dedicated GPU. We then ran some GPU benchmarks off-screen so that the resolution of these displays does not impact the final result, and in GFX Bench, the 13-inch Intel model got 52 frames per second, the 15-inch got 92, and then the M1 got 130, guys. Yes, a 150% improvement compared to the 13-inch Intel model from just a few months ago, and 41% uh, faster than my 15-inch 2019 model. So there you go, guys. If you plan on doing any gaming, as long as the game is running natively, you'll actually get better performance from the M1 13-inch MacBook Pro than compared to something like a 15-inch MacBook Pro with an 8-core processor and a dedicated Radeon Pro 560X GPU. Also, in case you're wondering if you should get the 8GB of RAM model or the 16GB, we've actually tested both, and we haven't really found any major differences between the two. Like in video editing, the 16GB of RAM model was about 4 minutes faster, um, but that was for a project that took almost 50 minutes to render. Now, I would still suggest the 16GB of RAM model if you can afford it, as it will be better for future-proofing. However, the 8GB of RAM model is still very, very good, and it performs even better than the 16GB of RAM Intel model, again, from just a few months ago. Compared to the MacBook Air, we found that the Pro was only about 6.52% faster, and only when it came to prolonged video tasks, such as long video exports. So, to be honest, if you're thinking about getting a MacBook Pro just because of that extra performance that it offers over the air, just don't. Just get here. As this year, the performance difference is almost non-existent. But do make sure to check out our full MacBook Pro M1 versus MacBook Air M1 comparison video right here if you want to learn more about how these two laptops compare. Now, when it comes to the battery life, this has been absolutely incredible, guys. So my Intel bottle usually lasted me for about five hours or so on a daily basis, which was not a lot. Uh, the M1 model easily, and I mean easily, lasts me for 10 hours at least. 
And at one point, I managed to use it from Friday evening all the way up to Sunday evening on the same charge. And uh, you might have seen some of my tweets where I was really shocked at how good the battery life is. And I gotta say, this is indeed the case. It's honestly that good. For example, when rendering the complex iPhone 12 Pro camera comparison project, the Intel model died after 1 hour and 20 minutes, and it had to be plugged in, whereas the M1 model not only exported the project almost 6 times faster, but it did that while only consuming 23% battery life. So, in the end, what are my final thoughts on the M1 MacBook Pro? Well, if you've been following the channel for a while now, you might be aware that I've had quite a lot of issues with the previous generation MacBooks, from the GPU failures and the speaker failures of the 2016 model, to the keyboard failures of the 2017 model, and not even to mention the daily T2 crashes of the 2018 and 2020 13-inch uh, MacBook Pro. Apple's 2016 generation of MacBooks has been cursed, not just for me, but also for hundreds of thousands of users who've also reported issues with the keyboards, the overheating, and of course, those pesky T2 crashes. But luckily, I have no issues with this one at all. There are no T2 crashes as it, you know, doesn't have a T2 chip. So really, my only complaints here are the fact that you cannot connect more than one monitor and the fact that you can install Windows or use an eGPU. So if any of these three issues are a major problem for you, just skip it and wait until next year's 14-inch MacBook Pro, as that will be a massive change. But for this year, it is pretty clear that Apple intentionally decided not to redesign it, as they wanted people to focus on the performance improvements as well as on the battery life instead. So my final suggestion would be this one. If you need a new MacBook right now, go for the MacBook Air. If you are a pro user and you would like to upgrade to an M1 Mac, this one's very good. But the one from next year will be an even bigger upgrade, an upgrade that I would suggest you wait for. But yeah, let me know in the comments your thoughts on the M1 Max, if you bought any, and if you want to buy any, by the way, feel free to use our links below because they do help support a the channel, they don't cost you anything. And definitely subscribe if you want to see more in-depth tech videos like this one, hopefully was. And as always, thanks for watching.